as we uh, dig into kind of our, our kind of most suspicious character in this text in Genesis chapter uh, 6, verses 1 through 4, um, we're told about the sons of God coming down and taking daughters of men. Um, then God gives a little, a little uh, commentary. God speaks into that and says that his spirit, his ruach, would not dwell with uh, mankind forever, um, and that his days would be 120 years. Uh, and then the narrator comes back and says more again about the sons of God taking the daughters of men. <clears throat> and the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and thereafter, which is kind of an interesting little thing. They were there, there, and also after. What is he saying? We'll talk about that. Um, and then he repeats it again. And then he can, concludes by saying, these are the men of um, the mighty warriors of old, the men of renown. And that word um, mighty warrior is the word gibor or giborim. Gibor is singular. Giborim is plural for mighty warriors. So as we think about this offspring, right? They, sons of God, have sex with daughters of men and they give birth to the Nephilim. All of a sudden, the Nephilim, it's going to be a, it's going to be a theme that kind of begins through the Bible. Um, and we're going to see these guys pop up. They're not always called Nephilim. There's several synonyms for for, for them. Uh, they're called um, the Gibberim. They're called the uh, sons of Anak, um, Anakites, uh, or the Ammonites, Amorites. Uh, so multiple little terms that, that refer to these mighty warriors. But they're going to cause trouble throughout the biblical story. In fact, we're going to bump into them literally as we go along all the way through up to, da up to King David. Think with me a little bit about, right, the big picture of the Genesis story. In chapter 3, uh, when we when we read about Adam and Eve and take the tree of, of the knowledge of Tov and Ra, good and evil, they take that tree because they did what was right in their own eyes. And then God gives this, this consequence, and he speaks to the serpent and says, uh, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed, the serpent's seed, and her seed. And he, then he gives up a singular plural about the woman's seed, he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. So that's a promise. We looked, we spent a couple of weeks talking about that uh, when we were back in the second story of the Eden, the Eden, the fall narrative. Then we watched how the seed gets, gets passed down, that the seed of the serpent, um, comes to Cain, and the seed of the woman comes through Seth. And there's two genealogies, and those genealogies show us that the seed of the serpent comes to this Lemek guy who just, right, it just gets from bad to worse. Uh, killing uh, just keeps happening in the seed of the serpent. And whereas through the seed of Seth, it comes to Noah, who's going to give rest, who's going who's gonna to bring uh, good things so we see this progression. Uh, so now in chapter six, we see more of the seed of the serpent coming through the, uh, the Nephilim. Now all of a sudden we start seeing some signs of, of uh, destructive behavior. These mighty warriors, this is a thing. This is a thing. The men of renown. What, what's it saying? It's saying that there is this um, identification that, that people of old, and really throughout all of history, aspired to uh, a name for themselves. Men of the name is another way that's that's translated. Because they are killing machines. So the Nephilim were killing machines. In um, Numbers chapter 13, verse 33, is the only other place the word Nephilim. And Nephilim comes from the Hebrew nephal, which means Fallen ones. It's kind of sounds like nafal. Nafal. Um, fallen ones, and particularly fallen in battle. So these mighty warriors have a name for themselves, and they got the name because they were great warriors. They had killed a lot of people. They were killing machines. So in Numbers chapter thirteen, verse thirty-three. It is where the spies had gone into the promised land and they come back with a report and they say, you know, the 10 spies say, we don't want to go back in there because there were these uh, huge, these giant men and 
and in our eyes, we were as grasshoppers, as so we were in their eyes also. They're frightened. These giants come and these uh, Nephilim come and it makes them want to run. And the tin spies say, let's just uh, abort the mission. Let's not go in there. Uh, Joshua and Caleb, right, they're, they've got spiritual eyes to see. And they're saying, no, um, the battle will be won through the Lord. We can conquer these giants. They weren't using hyperbole. They weren't trying to uh, over-inflate the size of these these warriors. They were saying it like it was. These these guys are dangerous. Then the then the the narrator says the Nephilim were there, and they were called the sons of Anak. Uh, they're just kind of given an, another name for these warriors, and so we we can begin to see these guys pop up all over in Deuteronomy chapter three. Um, Moses tells of you know, a battle that takes place and they came and they fought against uh, Og of Bashan. And Og, it sounds like a pretty, uh, sounds like a Viking, doesn't it? Og of Bashan. <laughs> Bashan means snake. So uh, Og's kingdom was snake land. Um, think about the seed of the serpent, right? And it says about Og that his bed was nine cubits long cubits long and five cubits wide. You know what a cubit was? We don't we don't measure by cubits, but a cubit was a forearm. A forearm is eight about 18 inches. This bed was like 13 feet um long. Matt, is your bed that big? <laughs> Doesn't need to be. But for him he needed a big bed because he was a big guy. He was a giant. These hybrid creatures were giants. Now, here's what's interesting. It's not just giants in the biblical story, like the Bible has weird stuff, right, about these giants. No, the Babylonian literature that has been um, brought up through archaeological digs and discovered, they had giants. In fact, these giants were the founders of Babylon. We're going to See one named Nimrod in just a few chapters. Gilgamesh is a classic one. He's also a, a king of Babylon. And, and he was huge as well. This was a real deal. This was a real deal. In the literature of Canaan and Assyria and Babylon, they all attest to these mighty warriors. And we see them in the biblical story keep popping up. Maybe one of the most famous ones was with um, King David as a young boy. And he goes to fight the Philistines. And they bring forth one of their mighty warriors. His name is Goliath. And Goliath, um, his armor, it says, was scales. It was like scales, um, like a snake scales. And what does David do? He... He kills him. He strikes his head and then cuts it off because David, line of the woman, is a snake crusher. God has been working in this uh, spiritual, physical conflict. These, these creatures were part physical, daughters of men, and part spiritual, sons of Elohim, the angels. They were this hybrid, but in the worst sense, in a distorted, perverted rebellion. We, as the image bearers of God, are also dirt people. We're made of the dust, but we have God breathed life into us. We're also intended to be this, this combination of heaven and earth. You and I, as his representatives, the battle they fought, and David won. He conquered. He defeated the Nephilim. He defeated the the Gabor, the Giborim, so that there were no more of them. They're not, they're not roaming the earth any longer. David, as a type of Christ, defeated them. But the reality of spiritual warfare lives on. They come back to us. You and I are in a battle. I believe... Um, unequivocally, that this passage is in Genesis chapter 6 to show us where the battle 
started. The spiritual rebellion started and, and the conflict throughout the Old Testament was fueled through these warriors, through these people that were killing machines. They represented everything bad in a broken world. And they are what fueled the genocide of the pre-flood culture, which we'll look at in weeks to come. But that battle lives on. That battle lives on for us in a spiritual dimension. And we can kill our giants. I don't know what your giants are. Giants of depression, giants of loneliness, giants of despair, giants of fear, anxiety. I don't know what they are. But I know that just as God could empower King David and Joshua and Moses to slay their giants, he can empower us to slay ours. Lord Jesus, we simply want to receive a deepening sense of the battle that is yours, but Lord, it's one that we are in the midst of. It's one that you want to equip us to get through and to conquer the things that would want to conquer us. Defeat the things that would want to defeat us. Have victory over the things that would make us the victims of spiritual perpetrators. Lord Jesus, enable us to trust you, to stay in step with you. Give us victory today over the things that would distract us. I will see you tomorrow. God bless.